Without further ado, I just want to introduce uh, the series because this is the first, very exciting, the first event in a, a, a new series of uh, events focusing on uh, COVID-19, um, public purpose in the time of COVID-19 that the IIPP uh, is uh, launching. Um, the pandemic has shone a, a very bright light uh, on the problems of our model of capitalism, of our modern economies and our societies, um, whether that's weaknesses in our healthcare systems, most obviously, but also more generally the fragility of our economic system, whether it's insecurity of work, high levels of debt, or business models more focused on the short term uh, than longer term societal objectives. And of course, it's a crisis that makes clear to everyone, even the most libertarian of economists, that we do actually need the state. Um, the, the state is key uh, to surviving shocks like this. Um, pan, uh, pandemics are the ultimate collective action problem um, when societies absolutely must work together, um, whether it's collective social distancing, whether it's scientists and the government working together to create a vaccine, um, it's vital uh, that the private sector and the, and the government and households work together. So that is uh, good news, I think, for the Institute, because our focus is very much on the role of the state in shaping a better capitalism, in how the state can, can shape uh, markets uh, to support public purpose and public value. Now, of course, we're at a very interesting inflection point in this uh, pandemic because we've had the initial uh, health crisis. We are about to, we are entering the economic crisis. Countries are in uh, recession. And that's why it's uh, great that we're able to use this first event to focus on the macroeconomics of COVID-19. Um, and we are going to focus very much today on the macroeconomic issues. Now, coronavirus has caused an unprecedented economic collapse in advanced economies, with most economists now accepting this will be uh, the biggest uh, recession uh, since the 1930s in our, in our lifetimes. Uh, first quarter GDP contractions are the worst on record and forecasts for the second quarter um, running from April through to June, uh, averaging between five, minus 15 and 30% contractions. Unemployment is soaring. In the US, the latest figures are 36 million people have lost their jobs. And this is concentrated in the poorer people on lower incomes. Nearly 40% of those on incomes of less than $40,000 have experienced job losses. Um, governments are stepping in. Uh, we've seen big fiscal injections, unparalleled fiscal uh, injections to prevent collapse in, in employment. And the IMF has estimated uh, advanced economies will end the year with government debt to GDP ratios of around 120%. Now, those of you who will remember the post-2008 period, uh, the figure of 90% of debt to GDP ratio was uh, uh, talked up as the tipping point whereby economies would, uh, whereby growth would start being negatively affected. So we're going to be well in excess of that, of that figure. Um, so there's a huge number of questions that we, we, we need to focus on. Uh, we've also seen central banks uh, expand their balance sheets to an even greater extent than they did in 2008 to try and support uh, financial markets and more explicitly supporting government spending. So without further ado, I want to turn to our panelists, our two speakers who are extremely well equipped, I think, to deal with uh, the issues I've just been uh, discussing, uh, and they are uh, Stephanie Kelton, who is um, a professor at Stony Brook, professor of economics and um, public policy at Stony Brook University in uh, New York State. Um, and she is um, a world uh, leading expert on uh, monetary policy, on macroeconomics and in particular she's of course uh, very well known for her work uh, on uh, modern monetary theory as one of the um, top scholars on modern, modern monetary theory in the world. Um, she has also 
uh, been an advisor to the Bernie Sanders um, uh, campaign and has been voted as one of the most influential top top 50 and top 100 most influential um, uh, uh, persons on uh, the economic issues of the day. So I'm delighted um, to have Stephanie with us today. Um, also, I'm joined by uh, Jan Kregel, who is a uh, director of research at the uh, Levy Institute of Bard College, also based in New York. Um, this is a center for um, post-Keynesian uh, economic thinking and, and heterodox theory more generally. I was delighted many years ago to attend the summer school that uh, the Levy Institute uh, runs for, for young economists and he's also director of the master's uh, program there. He's um, written a number of um, important books on issues of, of economic theory um, and been influenced heavily by Keynes, John May, um, Hyman Minsky, uh, his PhD supervisor was, was Joan Robertson, so schooled uh, very heavily in some of the economists whose work people have increasingly looked to uh, in the post-2008 period uh, for guidance. And we're delighted to have both uh, Stephanie and Jan uh, with us today. So without further ado, I will kick off uh, by asking Stephanie, if you could just comment, please, Stephanie, on your initial thinking, really, about the nature of the, the economic uh, problem that, that uh, we're facing uh, caused by this pandemic. Um, and in particular, maybe you could talk to us about um, uh, the short-term response you've seen from, from governments in dealing with the, with the crisis itself and you know, whether they've got the balance right between um, investing in dealing with the health crisis and the wider issue of unemployment and stabilizing uh, the wider economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be able to join all of you um, for this hour long or so conversation on a topic that is clearly um, critically important and everyone is wrestling with the very questions that you've posed. So, um, you know, it's, it's impossible to, I think, overstate the magnitude of what we are facing, not just here with respect to the US economy, but globally. Um, very few people, if any, uh, have lived through uh, an economic collapse of the kind that we're witnessing. You mentioned more than 36 million job losses here in the United States already. Um, that is surely, that number is surely going to rise in the coming months. Um, so we've got output collapsing, we've got unemployment um, that may well go above the rates seen during the Great Depression. I think more and more you're starting to hear people use the word depression and begin to think in terms of an event that may well um, be deeply entrenched and uh, long lasting and carry uh, long term costs, both societal and economic um, for many years to come. So when you ask about the policy response, um, you know, we have seen again, the Federal Reserve act very quickly and this time go beyond what was done in the wake of the financial crisis and the Great Recession. Um, broadening the scope of the kinds of interventions that the Federal Reserve is undertaking now. Is it working? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, I think the Fed's actions are um, helping to support the stock market. I think they are probably delaying um, what could be a very significant wave of defaults in the bond markets. Um, and the fiscal policy response has been uh, large in terms of the number of bills Congress has moved in a short period of time, some of them with very big price tags. And so on the surface, it can look like Congress uh, has done a lot already 
Um, but the evidence, at least the way I read it, is that the response has, that much of what was done was poorly targeted and very poorly executed. And the reason I say that is because we have more than 36 million people who have filed jobless claims uh, in the last month and a half uh, or so. And so we're not doing a great job of containing the damage at the moment. Uh, we could talk about why that is. We just did not have in this country the kind of uh, infrastructure established that would enable the government to essentially flip some switches and support incomes much more quickly um, than some European countries were able to do. So we're not, we're not pulling things off. We're not executing as well as some countries around the world. Um, I guess one of the things that concerns me a lot about where we're headed is that thus far, the federal government has failed to get significant aid to state and local governments, which are desperately pleading with the federal government to get them money, get them money quickly. They are hemorrhaging tax revenue in the wake of the shutdowns and the collapse in economic activity. And governors and mayors across the country are warning the federal government that if aid is not forthcoming and quickly, that they will be forced to begin to massively cut spending at the state and local level. And so we're already starting to see it. We're seeing it already in healthcare, in education. You're gonna see essential services cut. You're gonna see fire and police and teachers. And this is what they're warning. Um, and because the federal government isn't responding the way it needs to, to state and local governments, there uh, is a lot of pressure state and local governments, uh, especially state governments, feel like they need to reopen their economies because by reopening, um, workers can return to the workplace. And if a worker refuses to go back to work, then the state can deny them the unemployment insurance because they say, no, you have a job. And that's just a way for states to try to uh, avoid spending as much as they would otherwise have to spend. So this is sort of a vicious um, cycle that we've established by withholding the aid uh, from state and local governments. And, and you know that could just be another wave of job losses yet to come. I worry a lot about job losses that are beginning to creep into the higher income categories. Uh, initially, most of the job losses were um, concentrated at the lower income earning end of the pay scale. And what we're seeing now, I think, is uh, higher income earners beginning to also lose jobs. If you look at the food bank lines, this is really, I think, evidence of the strain. And what you're seeing are literally miles long um, people in line in their cars at food banks to get food. It's not because the grocery stores don't have any food. People aren't there because the stores don't have food stocked up in the, in the grocery store. They're there because there is an income in the bank accounts and they literally can't afford to buy food. And if you look at the people who are in those lines, in many cases right now, you're seeing very expensive uh, vehicles and families who say, you know, if they're interviewed, they, these are people who held high paying jobs who've never encountered hardship, economic hardship in their lives, but there they are in line asking for food at a food bank. So um, that's just a little bit of, I guess, what I'm seeing and what I see on the horizon and why I um, am so anxious about the prospects going forward because the policy response has just not been anywhere near, has not risen to the to the magnitude of the situation we're facing. Great, great. That's uh, that's gloomy uh, news, but but perhaps realistic news. Um, Stephanie's focused on the U.S. There, Jan. I mean, do you think you could give us a, a slightly broader focus on on Europe? And 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 I know you've also been doing a, some thinking about developing countries and emerging markets. Give us give us your take on. Uh, the, the policy differences in those countries and, and what the prospects are. What I want to do is to frame the way we're looking at this crisis and success that we've gotten it completely backwards in the wrong way. This is not an economic crisis. 
we're not going to solve it with financial measures and we're not going to solve it with the kinds of economic measures that we normally do for a crisis. This is not a recession. This is not something that was caused by normal economic processes and functions. This is a health crisis, okay? Economists have very little to say about health crisis. And the question is, do we have any instruments that might have allowed us to analyze what is going on? And I would say from the point of view of what we call alternative or post-Keynesian Minskian theory, we have two very strong elements which might allow us to analyze this health crisis. The first is uncertainty, and the second is financial analysis or Minsky's balance sheet analysis. Now, if we take uncertainty, let's look at the way the crisis evolved, okay? Keynes tells us that if you are absolutely uncertain about something, what do you do? Well, you look at something you know, okay? Our brains are designed in order to respond to things that we know. So you see an outbreak of the crisis, and what do you do? You say, well, this is something that has to do with pneumonia. We've seen this before. It's SARS. It's MERS. In SARS, we know that death rates were not very high. We know that the transmission rate was relatively low. And we also know that it sort of exhausted itself okay, on its own. So if I'm a politician and I'm looking at this outbreak, what is my first response? My first response is to say, well, this is really not a big deal. This is something that we've dealt with before. We can do it again. And what we really need to do is to reassure the population that this is really not something that's important. Okay. What did we discover? Well, if we went on, we discovered that COVID-19 is not at all like SARS that it's something that we have never seen before, and it is absolutely uncertain, okay? If we start out, the first was that there was no human-to-human -human transmission. Oh, well, no, we discovered, yes, we had human-to-human -human transmission. In fact, we had human-to-human -human transmission that looked like the reinfection rate was in the rate of five, six, or seven, okay? Things that were just completely off the map. Then we suddenly discovered that in fact, most of the contagion was asymptomatic. That is, we couldn't even tell people were sick who were transmitting the disease, all right? Now, I can go through a whole list of things which we discovered one by one as we went on, which says that this was something that was completely different from anything that we had ever seen before. Now, in that particular case, what do you do? Well, in that particular case, you refer to something that helps you try and figure out how this is going to evolve relative to what we've seen in the past. So we started looking at models, okay? These models, which we know are done by health scientists, but look very much like models that we use in economics, okay? If I'm looking at reproduction rates, we know about the famous Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers tell us about this famous expansion of the number of rabbits, okay? So we know that one of the things that you have to have is the reproduction rate, okay? We also know that you have to have some sort of idea of the transmission rate. And you also know that you have to know something in particular about the death rate. Now, if you look at the information that we had about this virus, we know that we had no information on any of these numbers. So that if you're a rational person, you look at the models and say, well, fine, you know, all of these models are based on information that they do not have and on information that we cannot verify because the testing doesn't work, we cannot see the symptoms, and all we can see are the people who are dying, okay? So what is your response to this? Your response to this is say, well, there's only one way that we're gonna solve this problem, and that's lockdown. We send everybody home, all right? Now, Everybody says we had a great increase in unemployment. No, this was not an increase in unemployment. We decided that people would stop working. We sent them home. You cannot work any longer. So this isn't a question of having deficient aggregate demand, deficient jobs, deficient everything else. What we did was to say to solve this problem, we're going to have to create 
okay? Conditions in which people do not have incomes. Now, the response to this is going to be what? Well, normally, if we describe this as an economic crisis, we say, well, the government should spend money. The Federal Reserve should come in and support. We should try and replace incomes. This is absolutely wrong. This is not what we were trying to solve. What we were trying to solve is to try and convince people that it was sensible that they should not be working. Now, what this did was to create a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the population, in every area. So the question is, how could we have responded to this? Think back to the Roosevelt administration. What did the Roosevelt administration do? They recognized that the biggest problem that was being faced by families was uncertainty. Uncertainty over employment, uncertainty over incomes, uncertainty over the future. How could we have dealt with this? Was it appropriate to, well, we're going to give money to banks, to lend to firms, to try to keep people with incomes when they're not working? No. The rational response, I suggest, would have been to say to people, you are going to have to forego a certain amount of your income. You're going to have the risk, okay, of being able to provision yourself. So what could we have done? Well, we have systems, systems like in the US, we have something called SNAP, okay, food stamps. We could have organized a process by which, similar to Roosevelt's Conservation Corps, instead of giving people jobs, we gave people food. We guaranteed that they would be able to eat over the period which was done. So the first thing would have been to try and create in the population some sort of support that would all offset the kind of uncertainty that we had created. So the first part, we say what we want to do is first we give some certainty as to the progression of the virus. We do that by the lockdown and we show that if you lock down, in fact, eventually you are going to cut down the rate of transmission. If we provide provisioning, you are going to be able to survive. And then if you look, if you take the standard example that we had in China, in Wuhan, you know that on a lockdown like this, in the space of about two months or three months, you're going to be in a position where you can talk about reopening, about doing something. Now, the problem here was to make this equitable. Equitable in what sense? Primarily, this would represent costs to people who work, to people who have jobs. We also should have shut down financial markets. We should have closed the stock market. And we should have exercised a tax so that capital incomes would be lost in exactly the same way as employment incomes. So that the head of the corporations would also be there getting their SNAP, their provisioning, okay? The biggest problem we had with the last crisis was that it was totally unequal in terms of bearing the cost. It was the households who bore the cost. Capital did not bear any cost. And the idea was to try this time around to make sure that there was an equitable distribution of costs. So you shut the stock market and you say, okay, basically what we're going to do is we're going to lose something like two to three months of national income. That's a cost that everybody has to bear. It's going to be borne by capital values. It's going to be borne by incomes. Everybody has to recognize that. If you want to live, if you want to survive, then there is a cost that has to be paid. And it's not the case that the government simply by dishing out money can provide the offset to that loss. The loss is there and it's not going to go away. So. Basically, my argument is that the response should not have been an economic response. It should have been the Roosevelt type response, okay? To deal with the uncertainty, to convince people that this was a cost that had to be paid to have the shutdown for two months in a very severe manner. And by that time, possibly be in a position where Wuhan was after two to three months that we could in fact return without well, without having people come in with guns in the streets in order to represent their right to go back and congregate and freely kill themselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just, I'll just have one follow-up question on that, on that perspective. I mean, um, 
what's the process of restarting then if you take that what some people might view as quite an extreme fully health health focused approach you know, how do you restart economies when you still need to be practicing some level of social distancing we don't have a vaccine we may not have one for for two years i mean what what's how does that process work because obviously in the new deal you didn't have that sort of problem no i mean i mean the new deal was a different problem we were trying to create employment okay but if you had had a stall effectively okay this is you now what what you want to say is that this is sort of the snow white scenario what you want is for the economy to go to sleep for three months. And at the end of three months, if you have gotten your RT factor down to something around 0 0.3, 0 0.4, then you can go back to a very, very normal kind of reopening. Okay, it's the question, you have to get control of the virus first. Your objective is mm -hmm. to get control of the virus. And your objective is to make sure that people can survive during that period and be willing to accept that this is a cost which they have to pay. Now, the difficulty we have currently in the US is nobody wants to be able to go that last mile in order to make sure we get to a position that you can reopen safely. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, I'd like to hear your, your views on Jan's perspective there. I mean, do you, do you think um, the sort of the virus cat is out of the bag to such an extent that um, we we can't, cannot now adopt Yan's sort of strategy and and re-enter a lot a more much more comprehensive Chinese style lockdown. I mean, or do you, I mean do you think that was ever possible in countries less authoritarian states? Some might argue like the U.S. and Europe. We are very we are different uh, in terms of our tolerance for uh, what might be perceived as a deprivation of certain freedoms. I think that's fair to say. I also think that we did a pretty darn good job uh, where governors communicated clearly um, with the people in their states. I think that people responded. You know, it was mostly, I think, you know, Jan's emphasis on uncertainty is, it makes a lot of sense to me because people are uncertain about, uh, uh, well, a lot of things, but what, you know, Getting sick is a big one. And for a lot of people, you don't have to tell them. You can't go outside. You have to maintain social distancing. You have to have this set of behaviors in place for this period of time. My behavior has changed. And it's not going to change back quickly because somebody tells me that restrictions have been lifted and I can go about my daily life as I once did. Um, so I, I, I don't think that Americans are um, probably well suited for the kind of, you know, hardcore lockdown that I agree with Jan completely. If we wanted to come as close to, I can't say eradicating, but as close as possible to getting to a 0.3 or 0.4 RT, that that's what it would take. And that's the right thing to do. That's what I would do. But I don't know that we can pull that off here. We can't get people to wear masks. We know that's probably the most effective thing that we've learned from watching other countries that have gotten this thing under control, that social distancing and more importantly, maybe than anything else, mask wearing, mask wearing, mask wearing. We, we can see in this country um, that there's a lot of resistance, maybe 35 to 40% of the population will look at you know, the um, signals that are being sent from the White House and interpret those to say, masks are for sissies, you know, I'm not wearing a mask. Um, so we have a real problem here. I would say, you know, I, I don't think that the intention uh, on the part of governments that told people to stay home, stay out of the workplace, work from home. I we were asked to work from home, not stop working. Okay, and so I think that the goal was to keep people on payroll and out of the workplace. And that was certainly the goal in many European countries. They backstopped payroll. Why? Because the, the bills don't stop. You can put, you know, the economy in a self-induced coma. You can hit the pause button on a lot of economic activity, but my rent doesn't go away. My mortgage doesn't go away. My car payment, my utilities, I got to pay. No, it's not just food. It's not enough to deliver food to me. 
it's medicine, and it's my recurring expenses. And so for no, I that, know, Stephanie, but 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 you can also then suspend those payments. It's quite yeah, but fine. So so okay, when, I, I, when I said when I said the cap the capital part of the system had to pay as well. This means the landlord also has to pay, and he pays by not taking his rent. Okay, all of those additional payments you could have canceled out. Okay? I, this I, is your balance sheet thing. You take your inflows and your outflows, and if you I stop all of them, I, everybody's fine. I understand. I've said from the very beginning that we can go about this one of two ways. We can sustain people's income so they can continue to meet those recurring expenses. And the less we do of that, the more we have to do of canceling the recurring expenses, of making those payments go away. I agree with you that um, we're already repeating the sorts of mistakes that were made in the wake of the financial crisis. The pain is not being shared equitably. I, com I am in complete agreement with you on that front. Um, and would, would we, um, would both of you agree that the imbalance here is uh, like it was in 2008, that we've seen this extremely active monetary policy with central banks. I mean, the Federal Reserve is now buying up sort of triple B type assets. It's buying exchange tra traded funds, private equity funds that, you know, previously would have been thought of as, you know, threatening its independence. Um, it's also um, financing municipalities, I see in a way it, it didn't used to. But but would you say that, that that side of the the balance sheet is being supported and and, it, and it's households that are that are not being supported is that the concern yeah and do you want to come in there yeah i mean this is basically what we did last time and as i said this is a thing we thought we might have been good to support this time and one of the i, I don't know i guess my basic position is the frustration that i've seen with mainstream economists who have come in and said well these are factors which in the past we never would have countenanced, but yes, now we're willing to give up our theoretical principles in order to justify expenditures of great deals of government money, not in order to provide support for the households and those people who were unable, we'll put it this way, unable to work from home because a large proportion of the lost incomes came in service sectors and everything else where people, you know, if you, you know, work in a restaurant, you can't work from home. It's very difficult. Uh, this is the place where we should have had the support and that's the place where we didn't get the support. So it was, again, from this idea, I mean, we always talk about this, uh, this problem with trickle-down economics. Well, this was the Fed at the top of the mountain, hoping that eventually it would trickle down to the busboy working in the restaurant. And I'm sorry, that was never going to happen. I just want to continue this, this theme on, on, on central banks, which is a sort of passion of, of my own. Um, now, um, there's... You're probably both aware in Europe, we've had the German Constitutional Court uh, ruling that the European Central Bank's asset purchase program um, essentially breaks um, uh, the, the sort of common understanding of, of, of uh, its stability mandate. It, it's sort of stretching beyond its financial stability uh, mandate. And uh, the, the threat is that they will uh, require the German Central Bank to pull out of the asset purchase program. Now, a lot of people see the, the European Central Bank's asset purchase program as the only thing that's preventing uh, yields on Italian, Spanish, and some of the poorer European countries' interest rates shooting through the roof during this crisis. Um, Stephanie, I know you've written about the Eurozone uh, before. I mean, is this a point of, of real crisis now for, for, for the Eurozone? And, and, and can you see a sort of way out of this uh, problem or, or are, are we looking at some uh, more severe breakdown? I want to have a look at something that came across my email just before we went live and I haven't had a chance to read it and I don't know whether you've seen it but it's this new report of uh, President Macron and Chancellor Merkel presenting a joint Franco-German proposal. Do you know about this? I mean this is literally just yeah so it's interesting it says that the two of them have issued a joint proposal on the European recovery from the coronavirus crisis. At its core is a 500 billion euro recovery fund at the EU level for solidarity and growth. It will allow the European Commission 
to finance such recovery by uh, borrowing on markets on behalf of the EU, and it goes on. So I don't know. It sounds like there might be something very positive that has transpired just in the last hours uh, or so. So, um, but but short of short of things like that, uh, a firm commitment um, on the part of you know the main players. I mean France and Germany. Um, with the backstopping of the ECB, or in this case, it sounds like maybe they have found uh, a way around that using a, a recovery fund that's been established for the EU to borrow on behalf of, uh, or for the European Commission to borrow on behalf of the EU. So I don't know. You know that it takes something extraordinary beyond the sorts of uh, things that have been done in the past to allow governments the fiscal space that they're going to need to support economies uh, and deal with the unfolding health crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you have any thoughts on the, on the Eurozone situation? It has always been the position of the Bundesbank and most German political leaders that a currency requires a country in order to sustain it. The EU is not a country, Germany is, Germany had a currency and it did very well. There will always be these movements inside of Germany that are attempting either to move towards a very much stronger federal union within the EU. And until that happens, Germany will not be in general and the German courts will not be in general supportive of any sorts of measures which have disproportionate impact on other parts of the, of the EU. So this is not a problem which is going to go away. I can still remember a good friend of mine, Willem Nolling, who was a member of the Bundesbank Council, when the Euro was being introduced, went already to court in order to counter it. We've had a number of court cases. And in general, the German courts always come down on the side of, we will say, the idea of either moving towards some sort of increased federal union. And this is, I think, going to be the push which comes out of it. Now, the difficulty here is that quite obviously, Germany is going to be the dominant player in any sort of federal union at the EU level. And this is something which is justifiably creating hesitancy amongst the other members. And I think this is really the only way out. It's not another fund allowing Italy to borrow more money that is going to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the subject of, of debt, um, I'd like to, uh, to just hear your, your thoughts on uh, the IMS predictions about, about uh, public debt rising to 120% on average across advanced economies. Stephanie, I didn't mention in your introduction your, your new book, uh, The Deficit Myth, which I believe is coming out um, over the, the summer. I mean, I, I'm assuming you've been engaging with this uh, debate uh, since COVID started. We, we've got a, a question from the audience here. Um, the household budget metaphor for government spending is deeply embedded not just in current political and economic narratives, but also in the media and hence the wider public's minds. What can we do to change this wider narrative and thinking rather than preaching to the mostly converted as we may well be doing on this uh, webinar? But uh, what's, your, what's your advice? I mean, obviously the, the crisis creates an opportunity to really change the narrative like perhaps very few other crises before have done. I think it's changing uh, to, to a fairly considerable degree. I mean, whether you were listening to Chairman Powell uh, in a very long interview last night that aired uh, here on a television show called 60 Minutes, or whether you read Alan Blinder, former uh, Fed chair in the Wall Street Journal this morning, I think um, more and more you're hearing sort of reassuring um, a reassuring tone, reassuring narratives from policymakers and central bankers, former central bankers, um, trying to allay some of the concerns about public debt. You mentioned the IMF, 
Uh, I think it's important to begin to help the public understand that there is a difference between governments that borrow in their own currencies and those that don't. And that's something that Alan Blinder uh, makes a point of um, calling attention to in his piece this morning when he says, why am I not worried? about the increase in uh, public debt right now. The second reason he gave was um, that the US government does borrow in its own currency and it's very hard to find countries that uh, take on debt in their own currency getting into um, a situation where they can't, where they default on the debt, right? Or where the debt becomes unaffordable, unsustainable in purely financial terms. Um, Powell was asked in this interview, you know, where is all this money coming from? How can the Fed continue to do this, the supporting the fiscal policy? And he said, we um, create digital dollars. I mean, that was part of his answer, right? So I do think that little by little, the public is getting um, exposed to a different line of argument about the, why the government isn't like a household, why its budget can work differently, and why debt for uh, the federal government in the US, for example, or Japan or the UK is not like debt for state governments for households and businesses mm -hmm. okay um and and jan perhaps i can i can turn to you we, we've we've had a question here um what macro responses are needed in the case of countries where economic informality is extremely high how are these different to formal economies and i guess uh, obviously the sort of modern monetary theory approach the idea is you can you you can deal with inflation um by raising taxes but of course in countries where uh taxation is 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 the institutions are uh, are weaker uh, the powers to do that are obviously smaller so i mean do you do you have some thoughts on on how developing and emerging markets uh should be thinking about uh so-called debt crises that they're building up because of that they're, they're of course faced with a sort of triple crisis of collapse in, in export demand, um, their currencies depreciating rapidly against the dollar and other, and other currencies, and a, a, an increase in their debt yields? Well, they obviously have the problem of internal weakness in terms of the ability of governments to respond. And it's interesting to see that a number of developing country governments have simply thrown up their hands and said, sorry, we can't do anything about it. Uh, I will not cite the examples. I think everybody knows just exactly who they are. Uh, so that they do have a problem of domestic health security, which is going to be extremely difficult to deal with. On the other hand, these are also countries that have tended to use the possibility of external borrowing in order to support their economic expansions and in this particular case you know it's not only that we sent everybody home this is sort of the equivalent when you when china decides to send everybody home when the us decides to send send everybody home which means that they've been hit also by substantial declines in terms of their ability to support the amount of external debt that they have and as we know, in these particular cases, again, back to my point of uncertainty, everybody is always surprised that the dollar continues to be, remain the world's dominant currency. But whenever we get into a crisis, for a number of reasons, there is always the flight to safety and the flight to security, which means that the dollar does become the attractor and these countries then lose their uh, capital inflows and you end up with either an external financial crisis or an internal financial crisis. So for these countries, as you say, the trouble that's uh, the problems are sort of tripled relative to what they would normally uh, what they would normally be from the point of view of a domestic economic crisis. Now, the question is, what can we do about this? And in this particular case, it's very difficult to refer to the IMF or anybody else, because first of all, the IMF does not have the resources in order to take care of this. And secondly, the IMF is incapable of doing what Stephanie says that Mr. Powell is willing to do, that is to use digital currencies, because the IMF does not have a digital currency. Now, a number of people have argued that we could improve the ability of the IMF to do this by creating SDRs or something else, but SDRs are still not the kind of digital currency that Mr. Powell has available. So that simply doesn't solve that, uh, that particular problem. So we're back to 
what we had in the 1950s, the idea that the countries that are better off, that are well off in terms of responding to the crisis, should be giving direct contributions to the countries that are less well off. We can't do this through market mechanisms. And I think this is one, if there's a message which I would like to leave from this discussion, is that the measures that we've used so far presume that somehow or other the market is going to solve the problem. It's not a market problem. The market is incapable of solving these problems. And therefore we have to take direct action in order to solve them. Stephanie, do, do you have any thoughts on um, what emerging markets or developing countries should be, should be doing to, to deal with these uh, big deficits that they're, they're facing? And, and also we've, we've heard about sort of potential droughts and food, um, real challenges with getting uh, food produced. No, I don't have anything that uh, is different from what Jan just said. I think the international community has to step in and... Uh, provide both financial and real assistance to these countries. I think that's, that's the only way. I'd like to bring us back then to, um, to, to advanced economies. I mean, or maybe some of this applies as well elsewhere, but there's been already some interesting debate about this inflation versus deflation uh, issue. So clearly in the short term, we're facing a, an inf a deflation uh, problem. Um, where there, there's both insufficient supply and, and demand uh, in the economy. I wonder how you, you, you envisage um, the, the, in the longer term what will, what will happen to, to prices and, and uh, what, what mechanisms should governments use to try and steer a path uh, through either excessive deflation or, or inflation? Stephanie, do you want to respond to that first? I mean, that's the... It is the trickiest question because it depends on about 53 different ifs, if thens, right? Um, I think a lot of it depends upon what happens to entire industries. You know, in terms of our real productive capacity, how much of that is going to remain intact and um, online or return to being online and intact in the years ahead? and how many entire industries may not survive or uh, if they survive, most will survive in terms of whole industries, but many of them may survive only as a, a shell of their former selves. And you know, then it depends on what policymakers are able to do. There are calls for um, recurring income payments in addition to you know, universal sorts of payments. And I, I would say that to the extent that um, you know programs like that are are put in place and maintained, and people's incomes remain high or even potentially higher than they have been, while at the same time uh, the productive capacity is diminished, then I think it invites the inflationary pressures that could be significant. I mean, I think that that's a realistic calculation. On the other hand, if unemployment remains extremely high, if we have 40 million people unemployed and incomes are significantly depressed and your unemployment insurance runs out and then you have no income and there isn't a response from policy response to support incomes in an environment like that, then I think uh, even with a constriction in supply capacity, you could have a deflationary outlook in the years ahead. So it's, it just depends on a lot of things. There have been, there've been a number of calls for a, a universal basic income or a helicopter money type procedure where the central bank essentially sends people a check in the post, which the US has, has done, as I understand, in a one-off case. Are you sort of saying that um, you need to you need to have the jobs there as well, and, and and would you then pursue more of a sort of job guarantee type scheme as a, as a better way through that inflation problem? Well, I think in many ways it can help to mitigate that inflation problem because it is a targeted program, so that the employment and the income is being created, in, if you like, at the bottom. It's a bottom up policy 
uh, carries, it has to carry less inflation risk than um, a universal payment to every single person for a long period of time. Um, and yes, I think, you know, my, Jan's colleagues at the Levy Institute, Randy Ray, Pavlina Cherneva, uh, and others have been writing about and, and promoting this. Jamie Galbraith has been talking about the need for a federal job uh, program to come out of this to um, reemploy people, support incomes, and also create new forms of output, care work, uh, work in the healthcare industry, um, you know, the smart grids and the green economy, uh, those sorts of jobs. So yes, is the answer to your question. Jan, you're the director of the Levy Institute where much of this work Stephanie's been talking about has been going on for many years before even the uh, 2008 crisis. I mean, do you think now is the time for um, a job guarantee scheme across across the whole advanced uh, economies as well as just the US? I mean, where, where do you think, do you think there's, there's sufficient political traction to make it happen? Well, this depends, I think, on your time frame. I mean, obviously, as a short term measure, you know, job guarantee is obviously not a response. This is one of the difficulties currently in terms of the system. We can't say we've got to employ more people when in fact we don't want more people working. We want people mm. to be sitting at home. And yeah, I mean more in the medium term, yeah. One of the difficulties that we've had is the traditional macroeconomic stimulus measures simply have absolute, well, they have no positive benefit and probably they have a negative impact on the uh, response of the system. On a, long, on a longer mm. term basis, yeah, then you, then you have to look at what sort of restructuring you think you're going to get as the economy evolves. Now, as I said, this is, we wanted to this to be the sort of the snow white deal. Everybody goes to sleep and wakes up. But obviously, after you wake up, you've been dreaming and the world's going to look a whole lot different than it did afterwards. So if you look at different scenarios, okay, if you manage somehow or other by mirror to produce a vaccine and you manage to get this problem under control in the space of a year or something like that, then you get a much different sort of response than if in fact this is something that goes on and becomes a seasonal, the equivalent of a seasonal flu. Okay, if you look at all of the service sector, and this is when I talked about the structural recomposition of the system, uh, service sectors have been hit you now excessively in terms of, we always talk about the problems of manufacturing. Well, this is service, service sector problem we're now seeing. And if these service sectors don't come back, then we know that you're going to have a substantial readjustment in the way incomes are spent. They're going to go into different areas and we're going to have a much different impact on uh, on prices and on inflation. So that's the, the inflation part of your previous question. In terms of the income side, obviously there is going to be a big impact because again, service sector jobs tend to be in general, in terms of uh, total proportions on the lower on lower income levels and the income levels that are at the higher risk of food security, job security, and so forth. And this is the place where the employer of last resort has its biggest impact. Okay. Now we're not talking about computer programmers and you know the serve the parts of the service sector that are uh, in the high income levels. That's not the the way the areas in which we're looking to give support. But because we're going to have much more volatility, presume, and I'm presuming that we're not getting this vaccine in the short term, you're going to have much more volatility in terms of these low income, uh, high risk, high unemployment risk sectors. And this is the place where the job guarantee program has its biggest impact and provides the most stability and support for a potential recovery uh, of the system back to some sort of reasonably normal level of income distribution and normal level of growth. And is that, is that because it essentially puts a sort of line in the sand under which incomes cannot fall and sort of forces the, the private sector to, to beat that if it, if it wants to take people out of those lowest paid jobs? Yeah, I mean, if you look, if it, you look at a, a readjustment, okay, 
the readjustment occurs when? Well, the readjustment occurs when you have a loss of bankruptcies, yes, but readjustment also occurs when you have markets that are sufficiently responsive to new initiatives, okay? So if you've got a new innovation, you know, you're great as long as you've got somebody who's going to pay for it. And if you're in a period of sustained recession, then it is highly unlikely that you're going to get a substantial increase in employment from new innovations and in these new sectors. So yes, what you want is to have some basis to prevent the system going into, going into free fall. And this is the potential. I mean, if you, if you can imagine that you would to completely eliminate okay, the tourism sector, eliminate the airline sector, eliminate most of the transportation sector, most of the entertainment sector, sector from the US economy, and, and then just sort of think what the impact that would be on income growth and employment. Okay, and it, you know it's not it's not difficult to do. You go to the BLS website and you can pretty well calculate just exactly what the income loss would be because we know who is implied in what sectors and we know what their medium incomes are. Okay, so it's it's not a you know, it's not a difficult thing to calculate, but it is something which we have to keep in mind as one possible result. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Stephanie. I mean. You've been involved in uh, thinking and, and activism around the green new the concept of a green new deal. I mean, Jan's just talked about the, the potential. You both talked about the huge job losses in certain sectors, aviation, uh, the, the energy industry, oil industry is a particular offshore oil, a particular issue here in, in the UK, uh, the coal industry, perhaps uh, across Europe. Um, I mean, do you think uh, uh, what what should be the role of the of the state now in trying to deal with this uh, reconstruction or, or this or this recovery? I mean, for just to give a specific example, if if, if you have a, a an airline which is basically looking which basically appears to be insolvent, um, looking at its current um, uh, sort of projections. It, you know, is the role of government to say that's a sector that's essentially going to die off um, naturally and we need to reduce carbon emissions, let's let it go? Or, or should the state be getting involved, uh, taking equity stakes or putting specific kinds of conditionalities on, on bailouts, bailouts to try and keep, the, keep some jobs at least and steer it towards a, a, a sort of greener pathway? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think that... Um major industries and corporations that receive uh, whether you want to call it federal bailouts or fe federal aid, uh, there ought to be um, restrictions on those corporations going forward in terms of, you know, from everything to worker representation, maybe on boards to, um, you know, what companies can do in terms of buybacks, um, dividends, that sort of thing. Um, it's an, there's an opportunity. I don't think that the airline industry is going to disappear. I don't think we can, uh, that's reasonable and I don't think it's desirable. So, um, you know, governments are going to have to make decisions about, and strategic decisions about these different industries. I do think that letting the fossil fuel industry um, fail is a good idea. I mean, I think that it is time and past time to transition to cleaner, sustainable forms of energy. And, um, you know, that is a place where we could make a strategic decision now to phase out that form of energy production strategically and to begin to think about ways to foster through state investment uh, a boom in solar and wind to um, foster new technologies and advances in electric vehicles and solar and wind and smart grids and, and the whole new thing, right? Um, in terms of other industries, healthcare, for example, we are unique in the United States in that we do not guarantee healthcare to all people. And we ought to have a massive build out of community health centers so that we can provide basic healthcare to everyone at a very low cost. We could do it for about $1,000 on a per capita basis, just basic healthcare for everyone. But yeah, this is an opportunity, I think, to rebuild and reshape the way that we live and work. And that future can um, 
can be a very positive, optimistic one. It can be one that includes less time commuting for workers. I think we're going to see more people uh, as we ask people to work from home. I think companies are going to find ways to allow more of their employees to work from home in the years ahead. That's a good thing for a lot of people. Um, well, maybe we can enjoy more leisure and less work time, less commuting time. Uh, we may get more local. We'll have more local food production and more, a variety of things that we'll produce locally. Um, but it can be an inclusive and more equitable, more just way of doing things uh, going forward. But yes, some of these industries are going to have to be strategically, I think, downsized and in some cases um, completely phased out. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, Keynes famously talked about um, uh, the uh, a, a world where we spend a lot more less time working and more time enjoying leisure in our families. Um, but he also talked about the euthanasia of the of the rentier, um, and we were talking earlier in the conversation about the need to to still pay the bills. Um, uh, and we have a question here from the audience. Uh, asking whether, uh, how can we assure any stimulus measures don't end up creating asset bubbles that increase the cost of, of housing? I mean, what do you think the barriers are to the kind of um, optimistic vision that Stephanie's uh, just presented in, and is finance part of, the, uh, part of the problem here? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not quite sure Stephanie was being optimistic. She was just telling us what we should what we should be doing. Now, whether we have the people who are responsible for doing it is quite something else again, uh, because these are governmental decisions which have to be taken. I think it's pretty clear that we know what we have to do. The question is, are we are we sensible and rational enough? to elect people who are willing to take those kinds of decisions on the one hand. And that's where I, I say I'm not particularly sure that this is optimistic. We know what we have to do. It's just a question of getting people to, uh, getting people in fact to, uh, to do them. In terms of what, you know, what we could see going, you know, if we want to see going forward, uh, the Difficulty, Keynes actually thought that you were going to get some sort of, how can we put this, peak productivity or peak innovation or something like that. And as we well know, these are things which don't happen. If we look at the distribution of expenditures over time, the distribution of those expenditures across different sections have changed dramatically over the last 40 to 50 years. And as you go from the, you know, sort of the steel automobile society to the computer driven IBM society, now to the social media society. Okay. So all of these things, which suggest that there are different, different things that people are going to want to spend money on. It's not going to be a case we're going to be substituting leisure. So that's the first point. The second point in terms of looking at these support measures, where they end up going. Uh, if you have the presumption, and this has always been one of the catch-22s, that from the point of the Levy Institute itself and Minsky's idea of financial fragility. If you have the belief that the system is basically a financial system and you require financial stability, by definition, you're going to have a preference for supporting those people who live and are part of financial interests. So that if there is a trade-off where it used to be the trade-off between, say, the automobile producers and the workers, I can remember when I lived in England in the 1960s, there was difficulty between the automobile, uh, the automobile producers and the automobile workers, and the government always came in and supported the automobile producers, okay, because they thought this is how you were going to support the workers. Well, in a financial economy, that's not the way it works. That is, if you come in and support the financial sector, what it means is the financial sector has better agency in order to reduce, or put it this way, increase efficiency and increase profitability, which means reducing labor incomes. So that this, you now this sort of 1960s labor, Harold Wilson type of labor government, if I managed to save Vauxhall, then I managed to save a lot of uh, jobs in the automobile industry, doesn't work anymore. 
And this is why I think it's very important to try and make sure that we're equitable in terms of allocating these bailout funds, okay? By saving the corporations, by saving the banks, by saving the employers, we are no longer necessarily saving the employment. And this is why one of the difficulties you've seen in the, in the current bailout measures, that is the presumption is that these funds which are being given to the companies are there to keep people employed, to keep their, uh, to keep their wages being paid, but they don't. And in fact, this has turned out to be a tremendous failure. Why? Because it's not in the interests of the corporations if they manage to save themselves, to save their workers. And this is why we need a much more equitable way of dealing with, uh, with these things. So we've got a question here from Jamie Galbraith, who you both know uh, well. Uh, for many services, large and small, from airlines to restaurants, fixed costs are such that they will not generally be profitable at the lower capacities that are possible under the public health realities. Airlines can't take as many people in the plane, restaurants can't employ as many people, etc. Does, doesn't this suggest that there needs to be a new cooperative model for many businesses of this type with cost sharing coming from the public sector so that they can reconfigure and remain in function in an adverse cost environment? Uh, Stephanie, would you like to take that one? Well, hi, Jamie. Uh, I think Jamie brings this up in a really terrific piece that he wrote recently that I might have somewhere on my desk. I think it's called, we need a radically different model to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. So people who are tuned in can and should uh, Google that title and read what Jamie had to say. I think that in that piece, yes, uh, some model, I don't know if there's only one option available, a more cooperative, but something for sure. If, if people are going to continue to practice essentially social distancing, to be reluctant to go into theaters and restaurants and bars. And as Jamie points out, uh, a lot of the industries that are impacted by the coronavirus and the public response to that, the behavioral response, they operate with thin margins already. And if they're, uh, you know, if, if um, demand declines, even you know fairly modestly, but remains down and depressed over a period of time, they won't make it. So uh, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to what Jamie's bringing up here. And I don't know exactly what the model needs to be to make it viable for uh, businesses with high fixed costs to remain profitable in an environment where consumers are not, um, you know, uh, f flooding their shops and restaurants and so forth the way they once did. But surely something along the lines of what Jamie's talking about makes sense to me. Mm. We're well, just following up on that, Jan, and, and my earlier question about the euthanasia of, of the rentier. I mean, if, if we can reduce those fixed costs, some of which are rents, I mean, you know, land values have been increasing very fast in, in not so much in the US, perhaps, but in many in many countries, taxes on, on, on land and, and capital gains, for example, are very low relative to those on, on labor. I mean, is, is one option here to, to really look quite firmly at, at how we treat economic rents and try and reduce the sort of overheads to enable some of these types of, of companies to survive? Well, obviously, there is a, uh, I say, an increasingly active Henry George movement, which is uh, recommending similar sorts of uh, similar sorts of arguments. In terms, again, this idea of the, the euthanasia, the rentier. I mean, basically, when we go to negative interest rates, that's what we're doing. Uh, if you look at it in very simple terms. Now, the difficulty is that the idea of the euthanasia, the rentier, is that most of the people who we wanted to euthanize have turned themselves into, what we say, social media tycoons and private equity tycoons and so forth, and are no longer dependent on uh, interest income. Mm. And it's very difficult, in fact, 
to euthanize them by reducing interest rates. In fact, what we do, as I suggested before, we simply make it that much easier for them to profit and make it that much easier to create a uh, an antagonistic relationship between their vested interests and the interests of people who actually work, uh, who actually work for a living. So as an example, if you look in the press, we've had recently a number of pieces who came out and say the retail sector is dying. Well, the retail sector is dying, not because people are not buying things. The retail sector is dying because for the last 25 or 30 years, we've had corporate raiders who have come in and bought out uh, the major retail sectors and simply engaged in that asset and liquidity stripping and left them with a degree of debt in which they can no longer survive any sort of any sort of downturn. So to say the fact that you know Macy's are in trouble or any of the major uh, major retailers are in difficulty is really not the problem of COVID-19 that's doing this. It's simply the fact that they have become uh, so okay. fragile in terms of their ability to respond to changes in demand that they're simply unable to do this. Now, I don't know if Jamie is suggesting some, you know, some sort of buffer uh, or some sort of insurance, that's, I think, a possibility. I mean, Minsky always had an idea that if we look at, say, for example, deposit insurance, this is we're really insuring the wrong thing. Okay, we really shouldn't be insuring deposits. What we should be doing is insuring the loans which the banks are making to particular areas of high risk. So mm -hmm. if we want to look at it that way, I don't know if that's what he means by cooperatives, but if we want the banks to go out and support small businesses, restaurants, and things like that that are relatively high risk, we could say is you now we could have an insurance policy in which the government supports X percent of of that uh, of that particular uh, lending in those particular areas, and I think this would probably be, be a better way than having some sort of cooperative agreement. I mean, I'm really not clear on how the the cooperative agreements would work. And being familiar with a large number of these PPP uh, sort of activities that we have in developing countries, in general, they do not work. Mm. And and Stephanie, just just building on on you know reform of finance in order to to get us out of of this uh, hole we're in now. <laughs> I mean, would you extend that idea to to say that we should also be uh, you know reforming the banking sector to to sort of steer credit towards uh, you know green sectors of the economy or or other productive sectors and and repressing credit flows going into, you know, say housing or, or, or you know, existing housing or, or buying up, you know, mergers and acquisitions and buying existing financial assets, which is the area that's really exploded in the last sort of 20 years or so. Yeah, I mean, I, strategic investments and directing financial resources strategically into housing and the development of other industries um, where the state, I think, takes the lead in this because, you know, Jan was just mentioning um, private equity, uh, referring to the loading up of many of these companies with debt that then becomes part of their fixed cost that makes it difficult for them to remain viable. Um, I think we're going to see that with housing, you know, if what I think is likely to unfold is that we end up with a housing crisis uh, where people are losing their homes and private equity comes in and buys up properties and rent prices accelerate. And how already uh, unaffordable housing for millions of people becomes increasingly unaffordable, then yes, I think that we need, part of the strategy going forward needs to be construction of affordable housing and the financing of that. And um, the private sector can play a role in that, but I think the public sector also has to step up in a big way and invest in public uh, affordable housing. And I think I forgot the first part of your question, but um, reforming no, no, finance, yeah, of course, of course we have to reform finance as part of this. Um, and, I, suppose, and I mean, just relating to that, we, as I said earlier, we, we've seen this, the Federal Reserve propping up various parts of, of the financial sector, including the asset management sector. You know, we've got BlackRock acting as the uh, broker for, for, for its asset purchases. I mean, 
I mean, does that need to change if we're going to, to, to recover out of this? Do we need central banks to sort of have more of a public purpose almost to be, to be steering credit into those areas of the economy where it's needed? Or, or would you say that, that this is really more of a, a fiscal policy issue and that it's a, a sort of lack of ambition or, on, as Mariana might say, entrepreneurial sort of spirit from, on the part of the state that, it, that it's lost the confidence to make these kind of uh, big investments that crowd in private finance? Yeah, I think I'm more, I'm more in that category, although I think it can be a both and. I just think that uh, a large share of the responsibility needs to fall on the federal government if we want to see these things happen and happen in a timely way. That, as Jan has said several times already, markets are not going to do this on their own. Markets are not going to fix what needs to be fixed left to themselves. So it's going to take the visible hand of the public sector guiding to some extent some private investment along the way but i think the state is going to have to lead okay well we're almost towards the end but i wanted to 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 ask jan before we finish um just to reflect on on what this crisis the lessons of this crisis for for economics more broadly um, we have a question from the audience uh do current economic models e.g dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models have the capacity to guide us out of the crisis or do we need to rethink our toolkit for analyzing the economy i think i know what your answer will be to that question but um, maybe you could just give us some broader reflections on um, what this means for economics because post 2008 i think a lot of us heterodox economists got quite excited that we were going to see you know some of the stuff we'd been working on for a long time actually be taken on by policymakers, but it, but it perhaps hasn't happened to the degree that we'd hoped. But is there more chance now of, of reform in the, in the economics profession? Yeah, this is a, uh, what I say, a diff difficult sort of analysis to, to undertake. I mean, the guys who do the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, okay, have been small industry. Okay, and that industry generates returns. So they have absolutely no interest to do any sort of changes aside from a trying to convince you that they can adapt the model so that they become more relevant. They're never going to become more relevant. Why? Well, I don't know. The simple terms is that uh, my understanding, and I'm not an expert in this, is that every equilibrium condition that they get out of these models depend on imposing linearity at some point in uh, the functional relationships. And in the case of crises, we know that conditions are not linear. So there's very, very little possibility to thinking that their models are gonna be any better than the virologists or the epidemiologists or whoever have the models of prediction of the spread of the, uh, the, spread of the virus, because we simply don't know what the parameters are going to be. And in this particular case, uh, this is sort of you know, extreme. But stay within the idea of, uh, of innovation, okay? If we look at the, I would call the new innov so-called innovative service sectors, your Ubers and Airbnbs and all of these other things, okay? These are areas in which it was very difficult in the beginning to predict what their impact on the system was going to be because basically what they did was to remove once a set of economic rents from one part of the population and transfer it to another set of the population. The programmers got the uh, taste of the taxi cabs, the programmers get the economic rents where it used to be the cab taxi cab fleet owners that got uh, got the economic rents okay so this is, was simply a shifting and the question is what was the impact going to be now what we couldn't predict was that these models were completely blow up in the face of covid okay i cannot conceive of anybody going into anybody else's apartment and staying overnight without some sort of implicit guarantee as to what the health safety of that is going to be so you now presumably these sorts of things are now, you're going to respond or have an impact which is even much different than we originally uh, we originally thought. And 
to put this into your uh, into your model, I would I would presume is just going to be so difficult that the model is not going to produce any sort of uh, any sort of outcome. On the other hand, as you probably know, at Levy we use a slightly different method of modeling. We use the stock flow consistent modeling, which in which you try to set up and trace the income flows and the impact on the holdings of stocks, and then to ask the question, what seem to be rationally compatible results from particular changes in these, these parameters? So they tell you what is the likely impact if we shift the income flows from cab drivers and fleet owners to uh, the owners of Google or Uber or whoever that happens to be. And you can then get a series of responses, which says that you're going to have particular changes in particular sectors, and then you have to evaluate. You, know, you have to say what is the most most probable result. So, from that particular point of view, I would presume that this sort of modeling, in cases of, as I said, complete uncertainty as to how things are going to come out, at least we have this idea of what came to be called scenario modeling. That is, we have the possibility of tracing out alternative scenarios, and then you have the possibility of making decisions on what you think is the most probable, uh, the most probable result. And in these particular cases, that's all the information we have, and that's what we're going to have to go with. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just send that question over you to you, Stephanie, for a, for a last. Um... A last word. We have a, an interesting question from the audience here. Kevin in London says, is there an argument for the return of slack in the overall system and a move away from hyper-optimized industrial structures we seem to have inadvertently created? And I suppose that's a broader question really about, um, you know, do we need to now be thinking more about the resilience of the economy more than its efficiency and its ability to increase turnover and maximize output etc yeah I, I think that that's right but again i'm going to come back and say that this is a place where government is going to have to if you like pick up the slack um, because slack is costly for the private sector to maintain mm -hmm. and if you want redundancies built in to the system which we should have as safeguards um, and we realize that, you know, becoming increasingly efficient and relying on just-in-time production and so forth, uh, in a moment of crisis, that becomes problematic because you can't meet, uh, you can't generate the supply that you need for critical uh, items. And we've seen this with PPE around the world, right? Ventilators, PPE, food, you know, whatever those things are. So would it be wise to recognize that you know, this isn't the last time we're going to face likely uh, a crisis of this type, you know, virus related, health related, economic shock. Um, yes, I think that makes a lot of sense. But I think that it's um, in most places, it's going to be the federal government that is best capable of providing what Mariana might call patient finance to provide the sort of make the sort of investments that uh, only probably um, the federal government can operate because it doesn't have to run a profit and watch its bottom line and it can uh, afford to build in some of those uh, redundancies and slack. And let me add to Stephanie's answer that you know, buffer stocks provide for slack and employer of last resort programs as being effectively buffer stock programs do provide the kind of slack at least that you get in the income and the labor market side uh, of the system which gives you the give you the possibility of providing some sort of positive response time even in you know manufacturing systems where you do have very tight uh, very tight productive schedules mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, that's been uh, a really brilliant hour, hour and a half of uh, conversation. Thanks so much to Stephanie Kelton and Jan Craigle for your time, your participation. Um, you can find links about both of them on our website if you want to, to know more. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first of a, uh, of a series of events at IIPP. Uh, on the COVID-19 crisis. Our next online event 
the second of the series will be next Tuesday evening, 26th of May. It will be chaired by IIPP's Head of Research, Antonio Andrioni, and is titled One Crisis Leads to Another, Challenges for Emerging Economies in the Time of COVID-19. And the guest speakers will be Jayati Ghosh and Richard Kozel wright from UNCTAD. And further details on how to register for this event and the timings as well as our other talk coming in the series will be posted on the IIPP Twitter account and website. Uh, thank you uh, very much for joining us and good night from me.